What's up and welcome to the Level Health Podcast. Today, Josh is interviewing Katie Prendergast. Katie is a NASM certified personal trainer, pain-free performance specialist, and precision nutrition level one coach. In this episode, her and Josh nerd out over training for the outdoors, including compound lifts, strength training, and training for balance. Big thanks to Katie for coming on our show. You can check out her website, kpxfitness.com, or follow her on Instagram. We'll have those linked in the description below. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you, there one. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyways, Katie, it's good to be talking with you today. I'm excited for this episode because um, I think that we have a lot of the same um, pursuits, a lot of the same, um, and a lot of the same, um, I don't want to say perceptions, because I'm sure that we arrived at where we're at on, you know, how we approach fitness and um, work with people, uh, probably completely different directions, but we ended up, I mean, I was looking at your, your posts and your website and everything talking about strength training and compound movements and how that can then apply to, um, really anything you want to do out on the trails up in the mountains. And so I wanted to hear just, I like to start out the shows. Um, can you give us some background on who you are and why you do what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thanks for reaching out. I'm also psyched to talk about this because I think like we, part of our discussion beforehand was, it seems like a lot of hikers and, um, you know, mountain athletes just think all they need to do is cardio and that there's kind of a lack of strength training, um, which I think is like kind of correcting itself now, but which is awesome. Um, but, uh, for background info, my name is Katie Prendergast. I am an NASM certified personal trainer. Uh, it's a national Academy of sports medicine, um, pain-free performance specialist and precision nutrition level one coach. So kind of, uh, focus on strength, uh, post rehab. A lot of my clients have had knee surgeries and replacements, hip surgeries, uh, shoulder pain and injury. So stuff like that. Um, and I touch on the nutrition stuff with people who come to me for weight loss or, if they want to clean up their diet to perform better or whatever. Um, And then I kind of, I work with skiers, snowboarders, hikers um, in my studio here in Denver and also online, uh, just doing remote coaching. Um, And we focus on building strength and endurance for whatever objectives they have. Um, I've also worked with like kayakers, climbers, uh, mountain bikers. So, um, kind of the whole spectrum of outdoor sports. <laughs> there is a huge spectrum. And, I, and I'm wondering, like, what are some of the baseline demands that you find with these people that you can, because I'm assuming it's not, you know, if you were to look at um, somebody that's kayaking versus hiking, they're going to be similarities, but there's going to be potentially be some differences. Um, how do you go about uh, working with people across this board? Yeah, totally. I mean, building a good um, foundation of cardio capacity, like general conditioning is always going to be priority number one. Um, Most of the people that come to me have a training background. They've been either running or biking or lifting or something, or they played sports in high school and college. Um, So I don't start with many people who are complete novices to training. Um, But even in that case, it's like, okay, can you walk a mile without gasping for air? Okay, cool. Can you jog a mile without wanting to pass out. Um, so we kind of work on a little bit of cardio on their off days from training, both to speed up their recovery and just to build that kind of foundational, um, cardio capacity. Um, and then, yeah, it's kind of like you alluded to sports specific, like a kayaker is going to have different demands than a hiker hiker. We're going to primarily be doing lower body training and core kayaking. We're going to primarily be doing upper body training and core, um, but all of my clients do full body eventually throughout the week. Um, cause whatever your weakest link is, is going to be yeah. the thing that holds you back. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to hold you back in your sport, but also just in everyday life. And I wonder what percentage of people end up not being able to do the things they want to do out in the, you know, out in nature because of something that happened in their daily life whether that's inappropriately applied exercise routine or just the daily, you know, requirements of being a human being, um, you know, slipped and fell or tried to pick something up in a weird way and they end up hurting themselves and not be able to get back into the gyms or, you know, out into the trails and everything. So it, yeah, they, they're completely almost inseparable there. Like it would be, 
just as short-sighted on, to only do lower body for people than it would be to just do cardio for people. Because again, like yeah. you said, there's going to be a wink link there. For the cardio aspect, do you find that there's kind of just like a good enough threshold to where you don't, it's not like let's get better at, you know, the endurance at all, um, you know, despite other things, or is there just kind of this level where you're like, okay, you know, let's keep that going. Let's get that on maintenance, keep that plate spinning, but let's focus on some other aspects. Yeah, absolutely. I think being able to run a mile is a pretty decent benchmark. If someone can do that, I'm like, all right, well, unless you're training for a marathon, we don't really need to worry about adding volume to your running or whatever, or unless it's something that you care about doing and enjoy doing, then go for it. Um, but most people I work with are like, I hate cardio. <laughs> they say that like in our, one of our initial sessions and I was like, yeah, I kind of don't like it that much either, but I do it cause it makes me better at other things. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, then we can kind of get creative and do like circuits and intervals instead of having them run or we'll push a sled cause it's a little bit more fun than treadmill or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know, just kind of that, like, can you do the volume that you want to be doing? Like mm -hmm. if you're training for a 10 mile hike, you better be able to walk or hike for 10 miles, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people get stuck because when, so I did a presentation a few weeks ago, a few weeks back about specifically about how to get in shape for the trails. And I started the presentation out because I knew I needed to address it. I just asked everybody who was planning on getting out there. Um, um, you know, this summer has an awesome adventure, whatever they got some, everybody raised their hand. And then I asked who was planning on not doing some practice hikes before that. And everybody's hand went down. So that's the basis of conditioning. That's the, you know, the box checked to get in the door, get out the door, really. Um, but there's obviously a lot more that goes on behind there. And I think that we just kind of get stuck with that. But on that note, though, what are some of the main elements that you look at um, um, when you're just really starting out with somebody, whether that's the, in the first assessment? Um, and I'm sure there's a difference between in person and online. Um, I'm always interested, especially when we're looking at a little bit more sports specific, I'm always interested to see how do you start getting that knowledge, getting that awareness about the new client, um, whether again, in person or um, online. Yeah, there's a big difference between in-person and online. Um, I work with more beginner level people in person. I, If someone told me like, oh, I've never worked out before and I want to work with you online, I'm like, this might not be the best fit for you like let's find you a trainer in your area work with them for a while and then we can reassess um because i think there's so much value in getting that hands-on experience when you're starting out um but yeah i take everyone through kind of a similar uh like movement screen uh we want to make sure like you're able to lift your arm up over your head otherwise we wouldn't be doing any vertical pressing right off the bat uh, I want to be able to see that they have some hip and core control. So we'll do like dead bugs and bird dogs and planks and stuff. Um, I want to be able to see what their balance is like. So I might have them try a single leg deadlift. Um, and then beyond that, it's just kind of like, can this person move through like the full range of motion of a squat? Can they do a TRX row and like pull themselves up? So just kind of focus on major movement patterns and just seeing how they move without too much coaching or cueing from me. Cause like, I just want to see how you naturally move. Um, and then just kind of making little tweaks here and there and being like, okay, cool. Um, you can body weight squat, you can goblet squat, but maybe we're not going to throw you under a barbell just yet. Um, kind of like finding the right exercise for where they're at. That's, that's funny because that's exactly my uh, general assessment process, focusing on those movement patterns that, you know, a human being as a biological organism was designed to be able to do. And, you know, can we do those safely and effectively? And then if not, how can we improve that? You mentioned balance, though. So and that was uh, it was I think it was worth noting that you said the single leg deadlift. What is balance training and what is not balance training? Because I feel like there is, or, or I should rephrase that, what is effective and um, intelligent balance training and what is not effective and intelligent balance training? Because it seems like one of those that gets very um, fad like. Uh, yeah, for sure. I could get on a real soapbox about this, but I'll just, I'll. <laughs> no, summarize. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Essentially, uh, like balance and stability training is not about doing a squat on a BOSU ball. Uh, strength 
is the foundation for stability, right? Like if you have strong muscles, they're going to be able to stabilize your body. So what you want to get strong at is that stuff that I was mentioning before, like squats, lunges, hip hinges, um, also known as deadlifts, um, and then upper body pushing and pulling. Um, when you build strength at those movements and just kind of progressively load them heavier and heavier, or kind of progress the exercise to where it's more difficult, uh, in some way, you're going to get stronger and we want to be able to express that strength on a stable surface because that's where it's safe to train. Like even think risk reward, right? Like, can I get strong doing squats? Yes. Can I get strong doing squats on a BOSU ball? Sure. But which one might hurt me if I fall off? Probably not the floor. Um, and kind of the whole point of training for like sports or outdoor recreation is to enjoy the stuff that you're doing outside of the gym. You know, you don't want to get hurt in the gym because then you can't yeah. go out and hike or snowboard or whatever. Um, it's just kind of interesting to me. Like when clients will come in and be like, I did this thing that I really didn't think I could do. And it's the, like, the most random thing, like picking mm-hmm. up their nightstand or like, uh, I've had a client who she keeps injuring her back, but every time she hurts it, she recovers faster. And she's like, it's so crazy because this kind of thing would have set me back a month or two last time around, but it only set me back a week or two this time. Um, and just Identifying like, those things yeah. is so important. Yeah. Building, building that, that confidence in yourself um, within the clients is, is so, so incredibly important, but I think it's not necessarily um, in the job description of, or it seems to not necessarily be in the job description of a personal trainer to dig a little bit deeper and think a little bit more about behaviors and things like that. Cause I'm sure people come to you with these big lofty, you know, I want to climb this mountain. I want to do this through hike, whatever it is, but like we can set those big lofty goals, but if we're not putting breadcrumbs along the way and, and setting them up for victories along the way, they may get there, you know, they, it, that extrinsic thing may be enough. But let's get some wins along the way so they build confidence and they build, you know, that self-efficacy along the way. Absolutely. So we've covered really the benefits of strength training. I don't think that we need to go into balance any more than that unless you wanted to. It's always hard to, to um, kind of, it seems hard to kind of um, articulate why balancing doing the things on the BOSU balls really doesn't apply but it's really I mean it is really an enriched environment for that sake but it's not necessarily the environment that you're going to experience in your daily life exactly it's like how many hikes have you gone on where the ground felt like a BOSU ball none uh I will say it's a great tool for ankle rehab like I had a client with an ankle surgery a couple months ago and like her PT had her doing a bunch of stuff on the BOSU and it was obviously improving the proprioception in her ankle, which is great. Um, so like if you have a really targeted thing that you're trying to address, then sure, go ahead, use a BOSU all. But like just for generally getting stronger, put your feet on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I'm not really sure how you think you can develop strength if you're having to use little five pound weights because you're on a BOSU ball. But um, so the aspect of mobility. So, of course, you know, developing those big gross movement patterns and getting better at that and more efficient is going to then, and then also, you know, loading through an entire range of motion is also going to improve your mobility. But do you have your clients do any specific mobility work? Is it, of course, then targeted for each individual person? How do you go about uh, working with that? Absolutely. So uh, kind of to clarify something that you touched on in asking that question is that mobility is different than flexibility, um, which I don't think like necessarily people outside of the fitness industry understand the distinction. Um, Like if someone's flexible, we think of like, oh, you can do the splits or you can just kind of like move through big ranges of motion. Um, But mobility is your control of that range of motion. Um, So just talking in terms of injury, uh, injury often occurs toward the end of a range of motion where we don't have as great control. Um, so working on mobility, being able to control your body through its full range of motion is going to help you avoid injury. Um, and yes, to answer your question, I do have my clients do mobility. Uh, we do a dynamic warm up that, um, I cycle through kind of a lot of the same moves with most people because they're full body and almost everyone has tight hip flexors and almost everybody needs to work on some thoracic rotation and extension. Um, but then it's kind of based on like how I'm seeing them move and where those deficits are. And we'll throw in 
Like for example, I've got a session with a client later who had a groin pull and it's kind of, he feels it whenever we do squats and split squats. So we've been doing a lot of adductor uh, inner thigh stretching and mobility um, and just trying to like loosen that up for him. So it's not as limiting. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely throw in specific stuff or if we're doing an upper body day, I'm not going to spend a ton of time doing lower body mobility. You know, it's going to mm-hmm. be kind of geared toward whatever's on the menu that day. That sounds exactly my approach. Um, oh man, I had a great question or it seemed like a great question, but if, if I don't remember it, um, we'll move on then. Um, man, that ruined it for me. I had a really good, I had a really, really interesting question that I'm sure will pop up again. Um, oh man, that sucks. Well, moving on then. Um, so you mentioned that you talk about, um, actually kind of on the note that you, on your, your Instagram story today, um, the nutritional component, um, I, you have the uh, precision nutrition certification. I mean, you've worked with people with this, like how, how, where do most people that have these pursuits, they want to get out in the mountains, how do they go wrong with, with their nutrition typically? So I guess there's kind of one of two ways that it could go horribly wrong. And the one is like, just assuming that all you need to do is eat clean. Uh, And I guess for intents and purposes, that means eating mostly fruits and vegetables and the like stuff that's quote unquote good for you. And I hate referring to food as either good Mm. or bad, but since that's how a lot of people like verbalize like fruits and vegetables versus chips and cookies, we can just use those words um but just only eating like good healthy food um but they don't understand energy balance so if you're training for a 10 mile hike you're going to need some energy dense food to fuel that endeavor um and then the other way people go wrong is like thinking that carbs are really bad for you or sugar is terrible for you but again if you're going on like a long distance through hike or like a multi-day backpacking trip, you need energy Mm. and carbs are our body's preferred source of energy. They're the quickest thing that gets converted into activity. Um, so getting people to kind of understand, you know, just because food is slightly processed or it has carbs or sugar in it doesn't mean that it's, it doesn't have a place in an overall balanced diet. Um, And I guess I'll throw in a third thing, which is most people don't eat nearly enough protein, um, which is something that I have to work on with almost everyone who we start doing nutrition with. Um, And just clarifying that, like, that doesn't mean you have to drink a protein shake three times a day. Just start eating more eggs and yogurt and lean meat and fish and try to have a protein source at each meal. Um, and I try to work more on like habits with people, mm. although that I haven't, my, yeah. Macro that was my coaching. next question. Yeah. yeah it's, it is, and it's funny because it's not that like the macro coaching isn't effective for certain people. Um, and there are, you know, those people that are a little bit more robotic that prefer to just be told what to do. And sometimes, you know, that's okay. Um, but for a lot of people, it just adds undue stress and also decreases adherence. Whereas mm-hmm. if we, you know, promote or encourage behaviors over that, it really just seems like the more effective route, even for people that have specific physical pursuits, because you can get, I mean, we don't have to look at optimal. We can get 90% of the way there with just really behaviors and just practical, really basic knowledge. And um, I mean, yeah, carbohydrates are going to support endurance activity. Like there's absolutely no reason to be avoiding them unless yeah, there's almost no reason not to. to. I was hard uh, anti-carb for a while. And like, it was one of the darker times in my life, just, you know, psychologically like yeah no for sure I definitely suffered through some low carb phases and and kicking myself in hindsight because I was miserable the entire time and my training suffered you know like Mm. even if we're not talking about going out and doing a hike or a long bike ride or whatever like your training in the gym isn't going to be as good if you don't have Mm -hmm. carbs for energy so yeah. And then you should just, that's an obvious step. And the next step is, okay, what are the training outcomes that are going to be, you know, being um, disadvantaged from that? So like, absolutely. There's no reason, like, it's not just, oh, that workout's going to suck. It's like the, the products of that workout are not going to be as good as they could be. So they're not going to be entirely wasted, but um, I remember the questions that I have, but on the nutrition component, um, I think that there's a couple ways that you could probably answer this, but 
um, do you have um, athletes, because mountain athletes, they really can be looked at as an athlete at that level. Um, do you have kind of like a quasi peak week before people are going out, um, you know, just really loading up carbohydrates, really, really doubling down the electrolytes and the water and everything like that? Is there, that's obviously just my idea of what you would do, but is there anything that you do for people that are really taking it to like, they want to get really the minutia? Um, is there any way that you would prepare and get that last few percent? You know, I, I would do those things. Yes. Um, I don't really have anyone that's like that, uh, focused i mean these are all people mm -hmm. like weekend warrior style stuff um yeah and um, they just want to like be able to ski pain-free or go first chair to last or like hike a 14er without having to turn around i think um, that says something for you though actually because um we all as trainers like wanted to i think we all kind of thought that we were going to be working with like athletes and high level people but like i've personally found great much more fulfillment working with everyday people so that's not really surprising that you know these people have these pursuits and i've started working with people that are interested in hiking and getting out there um specifically because like i understand that the fitness space really isn't helping those people they're not putting principles in place they don't know where to go to they're doing just the local orange theory or something and thinking that that's going to prepare them yeah uh i kind of thought the same thing too i was like oh i want to work with you know people who are serious about fitness but you know, those people kind of already have their routines and not that I wouldn't work with someone who wanted to take it to the next level, but more gen pop has definitely been a lot more interesting and fulfilling. Um, yeah. and then it's yeah. definitely habit-based stuff. Like maybe don't eat a bag of chips before dinner. I don't know. <laughs> do you there. do anything different? Um, say you're heading out with something that, you know, is going to be pretty difficult for you. Um, but, and then potentially, I guess, um, uh, kind of off of that, do you, how do you know when you're ready for something? How do you know? And, and as well as with clients, how do you know they're ready for something? So with myself, um, it's a terrible approach, but I just figure I'll go do it and see. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm probably not going to go do something. I'm not confident that I can at least 90% get there and like 10%, you know, motivate myself in the moment. Um, but with my clients, it's like, it, it's also a confidence thing. It's like, do they feel like mm -hmm. they've gotten stronger? Do they feel happy with like their consistency do they feel prepared? Um, and then like with small test pieces, right? Like you mentioned, you asked a room full of people who was not planning on doing some test hikes. So if I have a client that wants to like summit their first 14 er I'm like, all right, well, you need to start doing some hikes at elevation, maybe start with a 13 er which there are a ton here in Colorado to choose from, uh, and see how that goes. See how you feel at altitude. Like, take snacks with you, see what works and yeah. like, make sure you're not like eating something that's going to give you a stomach ache halfway up. Um, and just kind of like trial and error in that regard. Um, but yeah, I, I try to just like constantly remind people like, all right, that was a hard workout, but you started lifting like 15 pounds a month ago and now you're lifting 25 or whatever for this particular exercise. Um, so that's a huge increase. You're like, we can prove that you're getting stronger, um, even if, you know, they're not noticing it as much. Um, but yeah, just kind of constantly working on confidence and mm -hmm. just like, okay, here's how we can progress this. Uh, are you thinking confidence in terms of, okay, now you're comfortable getting out there? Or are you thinking confidence the way that I kind of, well, that as well, but I kind of think of it like if, if worse comes to worst, are you going to have the reserve? Are you, do, are you going to have the confidence in yourself that you have the reserve to continue going? Because I mean, the worst thing that you want to do is be as far, you know, and as far away from the trailhead as possible and have something that you feel physically you can't overcome. Um, are you looking at it from multiple angles? Yeah, I mean, I think both of those play a factor of just like going into whatever the thing is, feeling physically prepared. And then as well, like, having the confidence in yourself to, you know, worst case scenario, like you, your uh, phone dies, so you don't have your map anymore. Can you turn around and like complete that distance out? I don't know, mm -hmm. like whatever, or weather rolls in and you have to run back to the trailhead. Can you do it kind of thing? Um, 
And like some of this is beyond my scope as a trainer, but just speaking from personal experience doing like hiking and uh, backcountry ski trips, um, sometimes you have to be willing to turn around. Like Mm -hmm. it's not guaranteed that you're going to summit. And a lot of that just comes with experience and like being able to make the least biased decision you can of just like, here's the facts. Here's how much food and water we have left there's a storm coming in we should probably turn around um so that's a little bit less like physical confidence like I know I can summit this it's just more like situational awareness yeah and have I mean I a lot of my shows end up coming back to some degree of separating yourself from your ego and I think that that's probably because the fitness industry is so ego driven and it, it definitely bleeds over from the professionals into how they work with people Um, Are there any gatekeepers? So I like to use that term and (laughs) it's probably not the best term, but um, in terms of like physical abilities. So you mentioned like a goblet scop, but we're not going to throw something on your back. So you have that graded exposure. Do you have anything that you feel is like a good baseline where before you go out hitting the trails, before you put that ruck on your back and go 20 miles, here are some basic physical skills that we want to try to check off. I know that you got all the, those movement patterns, those fundamental movements, but I wonder if you had any specific um, exercises perhaps. Yeah. So I would say, uh, it just, in terms of progressing things, we want to get someone to like a 35 or 45 pound goblet squat before I'm Mm. putting a 35 or 45 pound barbell on their back, even though it's mechanically easier to move because of, you know, the weight distribution and stuff. It's like, all right, well, if you can control something of that weight, then we can talk about back squats or whatever. Um, Yeah. I mean, I would just start with like, what is something that seems so easy that you would laugh at me if I suggested that as your workout, Mm. start there, like take a backpack that weighs five pounds and go do 10 miles. All right. Easy. Cool. Take a backpack that weighs seven pounds or 10 pounds, go do 10 miles. Um, and I always tell people, I'm like, Hey, I, I don't mean to insult your like physical capabilities by handing you a five pound weight, but I would rather us start light and you'd be like, Oh, that was way too easy. And then we can bump up the weight. Um, then for us to like come out the gate hot and do something that is going to be too hard for you. You might like drop the weight. You might strain something. You might like whatever. Uh, you might hate the exercise because I made it too hard from the beginning. And now you're just like, you're over it. You don't ever want to do split squats again. Um, On that split squat note, that leads me into my next question so perfectly. What is the value that you see? And it sounds like, what is the value you see? What is the value in unilateral work, especially specifically with a lower body? Absolutely. So the, I was going to kind of touch on this with the stability stuff, but got on my BOSU ball rant. <laughs> so to train balance, like we can do that by changing your base of support, right? So you can go from doing a squat with both of your feet in the same plane to doing a split squat. And now your front leg is supporting most of your weight. It's doing most of the work and you're forced to balance more. We can do the same thing with like a row, uh, go from bench supported to a three point row or a lunge stance row. Um, and just kind of changing that base of support. Uh, I had mentioned single leg deadlifts earlier, like, sure, that's a cool test of balance, but can you load that now? Um, or I've like, maybe in the past six months, I've become a big fan of B stance deadlifts, Mm. which is basically like a split squat for a deadlift, uh, where you have one foot slightly behind the other. So you're mainly training that front leg, um, for anyone that doesn't know what B stance is. Yeah. Have you uh, noticed that um, people are able to load that, that, that base leg a little bit more easily? It, I've found it's pretty difficult. Um, RDLs in general, like a, a bilateral RDL, um, pretty difficult for people to do. And that's just the hinge pattern. I think people have difficulty with. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, every client I've had and taught their remaining deadlift has been like, I don't get this at first. And it takes <laughs> yeah. like a week or two where they're kind of like, okay, I feel like I don't have to think about it as much. They're all holding it, takes... it in, in a weird way. They don't know what <laughs> yeah. to, to do with their hands. Yeah. And then it's like another week or two and we're like, okay, you've been doing 10 pounds here for long enough. Let's try 15 or whatever. And then they're like, oh yeah, that wasn't so bad. 
So that again comes down to like the confidence. Uh, I think the hip hinge is the least natural movement mm. that um, we kind of want to train in the gym, but it's so important because it hits your posterior chain and like literally all athletic activity is posterior chain driven. So you want strong glutes, you want strong hamstrings. Uh, once you get heavy with it, it's going to be core. It's working your back and your grip and just mm. like literally every muscle of your body. So that's definitely it's my personal favorite exercise. Like my favorite lift is a deadlift. Really? Um, yes. <laughs> I saw, actually saw that you had a pretty solid deadlift. I, the, the most I've ever deadlifted was 450 something. And I thought that that was amazing because it was, it, it was good at the time, but now I don't know if you've seen the numbers people are putting up with dead, on deadlift. Oh, Absolutely yeah. insane. It's crazy. Uh, I saw, I can't remember her name, but it was on hook grip. Some British woman like set two international lifting records mm. like with the heaviest deadlift by a british woman in competition ever and i was like that's pretty badass mm -hmm. so yeah cool stuff happening people are just like getting stronger and stronger it's crazy um that led me to this question actually um what how do you see the the this space within the fitness industry changing is there a good base of personal trainers helping people that have these pursuits or is it just kind of they end up with whoever is at the local gold gym? Um, how do you see that changing? Because the the strength sp uh, part of the industry changed a lot in the last decade, and it's probably going to continue changing. Are we getting left behind? Is this niche getting left behind, or do we just have a lot of room to grow? Oh, I think there's a ton of room to grow, I, but I also think that so I've been in the industry for seven years, and I've seen a lot of things change in that time as well. Mm -hmm. But I think. Yes, a lot of people are getting stuck with local Joe Schmo just because they sign up at Gold's Gym and that's who has room in their schedule. And it's usually a novice trainer, um, which of course they're not going to tell you like, oh, this guy just started yesterday, um, which that's a problem with the fitness industry. It's like you, it's hard to get in with the people who are well-established because their schedule is busy. And they're probably the best, but they're also the most expensive mm -hmm. and people want a good deal. So they see like, oh, that gym over there is selling 10 sessions for whatever, 300 bucks, which would be crazy. Um, they're going to go there, right? Because everyone wants a good deal. Um, but for anyone listening who's like thinking of hiring a personal trainer, don't go with the bark <laughs> necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, you, this is something you want to put it's you got to go to level yeah. and check out our directory there yes That's what absolutely. You gotta do. smooth plug um, hey, that might have been my first one so <laughs> set me up i appreciate it um, but yeah, like that's, that's always going to be a problem. I feel like, you know, consumers of fitness aren't necessarily educated about what they should be looking for. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had people ask me like, oh, what are your credentials? And I'm just like, I could tell you, but do you know what NASM is? Probably not. Like it's a well-respected training organization, but I could be telling you that and mm -hmm. pulling it out of thin air. You don't know. Um, and I try to pursue education that I think is going to most benefit my clients. Like, yeah, I want to be interested in what I'm learning too, but that's why I got nutrition certified because I was working with a lot of people uh, the first gym I was at was just general population and mostly weight loss goals. And I was like, working out isn't fixing this. There needs to be something else. And it was nutrition and it was behavioral psychology and it was habits. Um, and doesn't it suck that exercise just doesn't, you can't, ex I, I don't, I don't like to use like, there's a lot of those tropes. Like you can't exercise out, exercise a bad diet that I hate. Like, I feel like those things are definitely more harmful than good. Um, but it is kind of, and that one in particular is kind of true. And you, you mentioned it right there. Like, yeah, just only applying, uh, only pl applying once really small facet, like the exercise, um, the exercise, the calories that you burn during exercise is very minimal as compared to the rest of the day. And that's why, again, it comes back to habits and behavior. Yeah. yeah. Fun fact. Um, I have like a watch that monitors my sleep or whatever. And I think I burn like six to 800 calories sleeping, depending on how much sleep I get. There's no way, like a one hour workout's not going to get you close to that. So just like to put that in perspective, it's like, yeah, you, it's a trope, but you absolutely cannot out exercise a bad diet. You could eat 600 calories in like four seconds. 
don't know. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's the general movement, though. I mean, we, you cannot out exercise bad, a bad diet, but um, you can actually actually put in practice the basic basic principles and behaviors that will increase that calories out equation yeah, side of the equation absolutely. for sure. And I try to emphasize with all of my clients that like, okay, ten thousand steps is not necessarily magical, but if you're getting four or five thousand, maybe let's try to get you to six. And like, if we can just kind of generally increase your energy expenditure throughout the day, that's going to make a huge difference, more of a difference than in terms of weight loss, than the 30 to 60 minute workout that you do with your trainer a couple times a week. Um, which that is step great for thing like, is, yeah, <laughs> that step thing is funny because I, as I was, you know, kind of putting together a framework for that presentation I was doing, I was thinking like, okay, so, I don't know what just happened. My light just turned on. Um, so I, I might be haunted house. Um, I was like, okay, so actually you're like, you mentioned three or 4,000 steps. I had people getting 2000 steps a day. And so like, I, then I was thinking about, okay, so you're getting 2000 steps a day. You're potentially doing a practice hike of a couple miles on the weekends. At what point did you think you're going to be ready for this five to eight mile backpacking trip that is going to be uphill most of the way? Like, like the, the, the separation between um, being generally physically prepared and being prepared for a specific event seems to be just widening in the population. Yeah, and I think we can put a little blame on COVID for that. So, mm -hmm. so many people are working from home now that you don't even have to walk to your car or from your parking spot. It's like, okay, 10 steps to your kitchen and now you're sitting at your computer for eight to nine hours a day. Um, so just kind of working on, in like the general population, working on getting moving more throughout the day is huge. We can definitely do, you said, blame it on COVID. And yeah, there's definitely, I mean, we were headed in the sedentary direction for a while now, and that just expedited things. But um, I think that a big thing that we should be doing as fitness professionals is making it more accessible to people, giving them like the bare bonus, like understand what are the essentials and then how can we tweak those essentials to fit you? Because I mean, there can be perfect, there's, there is optimal, but that's not what's necessarily going to get you um, to, to progress. And in that kind of um, vein of making things more accessible, can you give us just three like action items in terms of resistance training for the average person? What are some like just three basic tips that, that you would like to give to somebody? So focus on major movements uh, that work big muscle groups. So that's the stuff that I've been mentioning, like squats, lunges, uh, deadlifts, hip thrusts, upper body pushing, pulling. Um, and worry a lot less about bicep curls and calf raises and those kinds of things, especially if you're short on time. Mm -hmm. You're gonna get way more bang for your buck in a 30 minute workout doing some squats and chin ups mm -hmm. and overhead presses or whatever than you are from you know, warming up on the treadmill for five minutes, doing some calf raises, and then finishing with 20 minutes of core. Like that's the compound movements just tick all the boxes. Uh, and it's going to improve your coordination. It's going to improve your strength. It's going to improve power and athleticism, um, which are the things that most of the people that I work with are looking for. Um, and I think just in terms of like your average person that wants to feel like move better, feel better that's going to be a lot more important. If you have more time, sure. Do some bicep curls, whatever. Um, yeah. A lot of time it, it comes down to like, how much time do you have? Like, what does your schedule dictate? Because, you know, you could spend that time doing curls, like you said, or let's get, get a little bit more bang for our buck for sure. Yeah. So that's one, two would be, um, I mean, this isn't strength training, but we've talked about it. Walk more like that is going to improve your baseline conditioning, which is going to improve your recovery from lifting. Um, and then the third thing would be like, learn how to push yourself. So a lot of times, like people who are new to lifting are like, oh, everything feels hard. You ask them like, oh, was that weight heavy enough? Yeah, yeah, it was totally heavy enough. Could you have done two or three more reps? Yeah. Okay, then it wasn't heavy enough. until I nudged them um, to do it. You want your and last one or like, two reps of the set to be challenging. More prevalently, guys without breaking down. Of, like, you said, <laughs> so, lifting with their ego and, and being this, like, oh, it looks so, cooler I think if I 
women like, and I work with a lot more pressing 50 pounds than 40 pounds. So I'm going to do it um, even though I can't control that A lot of people weight. are kind of like afraid. I've of going never to once weight. asked one of my male clients what they benched in high school, but I can pretty much tell you every single client about what they benched in high school because they always feel the need to tell you. Everybody feels the need to tell you because it's like, the number on the bar, what a weird thing. I think we, yeah, we could definitely take the numbers off, off of all the, the weights. And I think everybody would be way better off. You'd have to figure out what weights were what, but. Right. I mean, I don't know that that's actually funny. My, <laughs> my sister and I both used to do CrossFit. She still does. And now I just kind of gravitate more towards doing my own thing in the gym, but uh, she was trying to PR her clean and uh, we we're back in Ohio over the holidays and I, she went to the bathroom and I just slapped two and a half on each side and she went and cleaned the bar. And I was like, you just PR'd by five pounds. <laughs> so like, without knowing that there was extra weight on there, she was just like, Oh, I'm going to pick it up and it'll be fine. Uh, yeah. so there's a lot of like mental stuff and just like figuring out your limits and knowing the difference between this is uncomfortable because it's challenging versus this is pain I should listen to and mm-hmm. stop um, is an important skill to develop as a lifter or and an athlete in general. And it's also important as the trainer to, to consider though, of course, people are definitely not pushing themselves hard enough and they're just not able to, I mean, but that's potentially coming from the fact that that is incredibly stimulative and perhaps more uh, appropriately, um, incredibly disruptive. Like that muscle is potent, provided they're, and that's where you're, you know, watching their technique and make sure they're using good form. But if they are getting that type of disruption, they're going to feel it. So absolutely put, helping them find how hard to push themselves because, I mean, we don't really do that hard of things in our daily lives anymore. Um, yeah. So it's something that pe- may be kind of foreign to people. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I think uh, kind of the mind muscle connection has been lost in a lot of ways. And that's why I harp so much on technique. It's like, okay, let's slow it down. Let's break this down. Like with the deadlift, for instance, like where you feel it, what muscles are working. And if it's like, oh, my quads, then we have a problem because it's not really, your quads aren't a primary mover in that exercise. Um, So yeah, it's just kind of like tweaking their technique and how they're moving and trying to get them to feel the right muscles working. Um, That made made me think about um, one of my uh, favorite fields to look to that is perhaps not directly related to my clients, but I glean a lot, glean, 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 get a lot from, because I don't even know if that's a word, um, is the natural bodybuilding space, um, because they have to do everything right. And Mm -hmm. granted, we're not going to push people to the (laughs) eating disorders and all that, you know, um, unhealthy relationship with exercise. But as in terms of like the mechanics behind it, the mechanisms behind the physiological changes, like I love looking at stuff like that um, and that field. So is there any fields like that that you pull from, um, from training that it's just kind of outside of the box that I don't think a lot of people, because I mean, nobody's going to be able to name a natural bodybuilder, uh, at least in the average you know, population. Yeah, not the average person. Um, I pull a lot from like physical therapy and mm-hmm. I am not an MD. So huge asterisk on this. I'm not going to diagnose my clients or like put them through a rehab program. But I think like a lot of the stuff that physical therapists are doing with their clients. And my favorite is physical therapists who are also strength and conditioning Mm -hmm. coaches because they have like the best of both worlds, right? They have that intimate knowledge of um, human anatomy and kinesiology. And then they also have like an understanding of progressive overload and exercise technique. Um, And since I work with a lot of people who are post rehab, I think that is one of the biggest things that I draw on Um, just in terms of like understanding how little tweaks can change the uh, stimulus that you're getting and therefore change the adaptation um, and just kind of improve the efficacy of a workout for someone. When you catch one of those physical therapist unicorns, the ones that appreciate lifting, you got to hold on to them because like <clears throat> not only, you know, appreciating it and understanding it, but then also considering, okay, first off that lifting is not an issue. Cause I know that there are physical therapists out there that are, you know, preaching the opposite and, or at least advising their patients of staying away from it. And potentially to good reason, because who are you going to send them to the physical therapist can't take charge of them and run them through a session. So you know, again, you're going to end up with Joe Schmo down the street and definitely not going to do anything positive. But how many times have you been told 
buy one of your clients. My physical therapist has me do this or has had me do this. I get that so consistently because it's just, you know, a little bit of corrective work to get you started for today. Let's get those shoulders back when we're pressing. And then and they're like, oh, we, I did this with my physical therapist. Yeah, so many times. Uh, I You can ask any of my clients. I'm a huge fan of band walks on lower body days. And I've had so many people be like, oh, I did this in physical therapy when I messed up my hip. And I'm like, yeah, that's because it's a great activator for your hip muscles. So band walks. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you'd absolutely stay within your scope, but I feel like, you know what, actually, I think perhaps physical therapists are impinging on our scope. Maybe that's the problem is they're getting into our business stuff that we should be able to do as physical therapy, our physical therapists, personal trainers, because like you said, the band walk, let's get some of those abductors and external rotators woken up before we start doing something because we're sitting in this, you know, ab in abducted position all day internally rotated. So let's, let's start addressing some common sense things, um, which just so happen to also be stuff that physical therapists do. So all right, Katie, my final question for you, Katie, um, I think that you're going to have some good answers for this based off of your soapbox on the, um, the uh, BOSU ball, but how do you feel just overall that the fitness industry can improve? So uh, just full disclosure, I was made aware of this question beforehand and like thought about <laughs> it a little bit. And... I have to, I have to, I want to get some deep answers and I don't think that off the cuff, you know. Right. Um, so it's funny because we've already touched on a lot of stuff that I was going to bring up, which I think like the fitness industry, especially what the average person is seeing portrayed on social media is missing the forest for the trees. Like trainers are busy arguing about the best kind of squat, like back squat versus front squat. It's like, who cares? Just do the thing. Uh, or they claim, Which one do you hate the least? Right, exactly. Which one are you going to do and yeah. like? Um, and people like claim that their style of training is the best or the only way to do this or that. Um, so they get like kind of married to kettlebells or they get really into hit and boot camp stuff or whatever. Um, and I kind of get it from like a marketing standpoint. You want to brand yourself in a way you want to be known as the guy for X, Y, Z, um, and controversy arguing about stupid stuff that gets clicks and likes and eyes on your content. But like we've said, most people in general population don't need circus tricks in their training. They just need to walk more, uh, <clears throat> lift occasionally, eat more protein and vegetables and get more sleep, which is something that we didn't really address, but that's a huge thing, a huge piece of fitness. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when we don't have to discuss sleep anymore. That's just a given. Everybody should prioritize sleep hygiene and we'll move on with our lives. Yeah. It's something that I've had to work on with a lot of my clients. Like people want me to give them brutal hour long workouts and I'm like, okay, but you said in your check-in that you're averaging four to five hours of sleep this week. Mm. So maybe not. <laughs> um, so I think like, and part of the question that you would pose was like, how can the industry improve? And I think it's just by like simplifying and getting back to basics. Um, and then also like getting deeper with people, like figure out why they showed up to the gym not just it's not because they want to lose weight or get ready for a hike mm -hmm. there's like a deeper reason it's feeling overweight makes them feel bad about themselves in some way and they want confidence so they think losing weight is going to build that confidence and i've had a lot of clients come to me for weight loss and then they just get so psyched on how strong they're getting that they're kind of like okay well i don't really feel like changing my diet i guess i care less about losing weight than i thought but they're walking around with a lot more self-confidence because now they feel capable mm. of doing stuff. And they've noticed that like going up and down the stairs is easier. Picking up their dog or their kid is easier. Like all these things that are a little bit more important than the number on the scale, in my opinion. Yeah. I think that for most people, there is something out there that is far more important to them than the number on the scale. And honestly, I hope that there is because like, that's such a, an ephemeral and like nearly uncontrollable to the degree that people try to control it nearly uncontrollable um fact that's all it is it's just a fact it's not yeah. it tells you nothing but anyways thanks for joining me today it was awesome talking with you i hope that you have a safe um and fun summer out there in colorado and i'm maybe hitting you up to see about some trails and stuff in the area eventually absolutely so. awesome well i'll talk right. to you later katie bye thanks Josh. bye <laughs>